When reading the Christmas story in the Gospels, we can't help but notice the many symbols and wonderful imagery that seem to draw our attention to the main focal point of the story, Jesus lying in a manger. This is the moment where God came to us as one of us. He climbed inside our captivity. He experienced the human condition on our level. He then destroyed the power that sin had over our lives and gave authority uh, to us to be called sons and daughters of God. The theological term for this is called the incarnation. Although this particular term does not appear in Scripture, it's described this way in the Gospel of John. Let's take a look. John chapter 1, verse 14 John said this, And the Word became flesh, speaking of Jesus, and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, the Son of God, took upon Himself the status of a slave and stepped into our human condition, took on human form, all because He loved us. The Incarnation not only reveals to us much about the character of God concerning His love for the entire world and His willingness to sacrifice His Son in order to provide redemption for anyone who would put their faith and trust in Christ, the Incarnation also reveals much about the character and disposition of every believer. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul draws our attention to the Incarnation and really forces us to look beyond the symbols and the imagery usually associated with Christmas to three important qualities that Jesus demonstrated, which you will then see is really embedded in the Christmas story so that you and I could then emulate these virtues. The reason why we even have a Christmas story is because Jesus chose and modeled three virtues for each and every one of us. Here they are. Number one, personal sacrifice. Number two, personal humility. And number three, personal obedience. Paul then says the same three virtues need to be a part of our story. You know, there's a true story about a man who is out with his wife and they got caught in a terrible hailstorm. The hail was as large as baseballs. The man quickly realized that if he didn't do something, his wife would be severely hurt. So he draped himself over his wife, covering her with his own body, so that instead of the storm hitting her, it hit him. After a few minutes of this, the pounding stones finally took their toll. Uh, weakened by the onslaught, he collapsed over his wife, only able to shield her from the danger. After the storm was over, the man was left with scars that would forever be a reminder of the day that he saved his wife. The man's wife was later asked by a reporter how she felt about their experience. Here's what she said. Every time I look at those scars, I love him more because he sacrificed himself for me. Do you know when you and I get to heaven, Jesus will be the only person in eternity with scars. He will have holes in his hands and feet, a hole in his side, and he will be our eternal reminder that the only reason we are there is because he stood between the wrath of God and judgment headed our way. He covered us with his love. He took the full impact of God's wrath against sin so that we would be saved. You see, that's the story embedded within the story of Christmas. I'm Pastor Gary Comis, and I began a series uh, several weeks ago entitled People Matter. We talked about how important it is to see deeply, to look beyond the obvious, and 
take notice of those around us and what they may be going through in order to meet their needs. We also explored the concept of living beyond ourselves into a comprehensive mission to our world. If you missed any of those messages, they're available for you. Go to our website, access our media channel, and study along with us. Really lays up a great foundation for where we are going today. Now, today I'm concluding this series with the message, A Life of Service. We're going to take a look at Philippians chapter 2, just a few verses there, unpack those verses uh, about the incarnation and uh, how it impacts our lives. So let's dive in, Philippians chapter 2, and we begin at verse 3. Paul said, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Now, in these verses, Paul first addresses the virtue of personal sacrifice. Now, there will always be the temptation for you and me to operate in self-ambition, looking only to advance our own agenda. Matter of fact, Paul even said in the first chapter, verse 17, that some even preach Christ out of selfish ambition. If you can believe it, right? That's hard to believe, but some people do. In these verses, Paul is warning us that there are some people that are they're just going to strive with other people. Uh, they are not mature in the Lord, uh, at least not yet, and they may give in to... Uh, a number of things, like focusing on differences. They may give in to jealousy or envy, pushing for position or recognition, uh, forming cliques. And if they don't get their way, they strive against other people. The result, as you could imagine, is disunity and divisiveness among believers within the church. And so, using the incarnation as an example, Paul is simply saying, don't be one of those people. Don't fall into that category. That's not who you are. You are a child of God. And the scripture says, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart, so be motivated by that love. Don't, don't, don't fall into that category. But just like Jesus came personally to sacrifice and serve others, Paul is simply saying to us, allow personal sacrifice and service toward others to be embedded in your story as a believer. Why? Because people matter. Paul uh, said this in Romans chapter 12, uh, starting at verse 9. He said, let love be genuine. Let your love be authentic. Don't be, don't be disingenuous and, and, and self-serving. No, 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 no. Let your love be genuine. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Look at this. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful with zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Look at this. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. That's powerful. You see, it's describing our behavior and disposition as a believer. Then Paul said this in Romans chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. Paul is reminding us of the call of God that is upon our lives. Matter of fact, he said, in Ephesians, that we ought to walk in a manner worthy of the call that is upon us. 
uh, the weight of this call in that our responsibility, uh, as he taught us in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said that we, we're supposed to be ministers of reconciliation. He's put in us the message of reconciliation. And he said, we are ambassadors for Christ. Why do we do all of this? Well, for the same reason why Jesus chose to take on human form. Because people matter. So that we fully understand what a life of service looks like, Paul goes deeper and he models it for us. We can see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's start at verse 19. Familiar portion of scripture to, to most of us, I'm sure. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. Look at this. I have become all things to all people that by all means I may save some. And you wonder why? Well, he lets us know. Look at the next verse. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. You see, it's all about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about this redemption that God has provided for each and every one of us. That story ought to be our story. Somebody once said this, the cost of true greatness is humble, selfless, sacrificial service. The Christian who desires to be great and first in the kingdom of, the, in the kingdom of God is the one who is willing to serve in the hard place, the demanding place, the place where he is not appreciated and may even be persecuted. Knowing that time is short and eternity is long, he is willing to spend and be spent. He goes on to say, he is willing to work for excellence without becoming proud, without uh, to withstand criticism, without becoming bitter, to be misjudged without becoming defensive, to withstand suffering without succumbing to self-pity. You see, this is the essence of personal sacrifice and a life of service toward others. That's the real story of Christmas. And Paul is asking us, does that story inform our story as believers. Paul now uses the example of the incarnation to address his second point, number two, personal humility. Let's take a look at uh, verse five in Philippians chapter two. He said, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Notice he emptied himself. Uh, during the, the time of the incarnation, he did not empty himself of his divine nature. He was still all God who came to earth to save you and me and the rest of the world from our sins, if we put our faith and trust in him, that is the gospel, right? He emptied himself, not of his divine nature, but of his honor or glory or reputation in heaven. And he came down taking the form of a servant. One commentary suggests this is one of the greatest passages ever written about Jesus Christ. It paints the perfect picture of humility. No one has ever come close to humbling himself like Jesus did 
and no one ever will. Yet, If the problems in our family, community, church, and world are ever to be solved, we must choose humility. Our society is too often divided. It rumbles with criticism, murmuring, differences, jealousy, envy, greed, and anything else that the enemy can use to create division. I mean... We see it every single day. Just read the newspaper. Just listen to the news. I mean, it's terrible. The culture, the darkness, the bondage that we live in today. You see, that's that's obviously coming from the enemy. What? To, to, To divide and separate. And he seeks to do that in the church. To bring bitterness and strife and unforgiveness. Why? Because he knows what Jesus said, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. We lose our power and authority then as believers. And so we need to remind ourselves that we are in a warfare. We ought to be living a certain way. And that's what Paul is reminding us of as he talks about the incarnation and how important it is to be humble uh, and allow God to use you in that way. Have a humble spirit about you. The only answer is found in the declaration of this passage. Humility. Letting the humility of Jesus Christ flow in and out of our minds and hearts. Very simply, Paul is saying that Jesus Christ is God, yet he humbled himself and he became a man. Just imagine for a moment the enormous step down that Jesus had to take when he took on the form of a servant. It's utterly impossible to grasp the humility in it. C.S. Lewis described it this way. The second person in God, the Son, became human himself, was born into the world as an actual man. A real man of a particular height, with hair of a particular color, speaking with a particular language, weighing so many pounds. The eternal being who knows everything and who created the entire universe became not only a man, but before that a baby, and before that a fetus inside a woman's body. If you want to get the hang of it, Jesus taking on human form, just think how you would like to become a slug or a crab. I mean, that that answers it right there, right? I mean, this is what Jesus did for you and for me. The incarnation is a lesson in personal humility. The very same mind that existed in Jesus that led him to empty himself by taking the form of a servant, that very same mind, Paul said, is to be in us. Unless we are willing to step down from where we are to where needy people are, unless we are willing to step down and humble ourselves, unless we are willing to step down and address the hurts, the bondages, and the brokenness of others, our relational wounds will never be healed. So humility is the idea of removing the guard, if you will. No longer hiding behind self-interest and pride and arrogance and who I am and I need a pat on the back and it's all about me. No, it's not all about you. It's really very little about you. (laughs) Very little about me. It's all about Jesus. That's our message, you see? Paul said it this way in Romans 15, starting at verse 1. Those of us who are strong, you consider yourself strong in the Lord? And in the power of his might? Well, he says, he's got something for us, right? Those of us who are strong are able uh, and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter and not just do it, uh, I'm sorry, and not just do what is most convenient for us. I like this phrase, 
Strength is for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how could I help? That's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't make it easy for himself to, uh, by avoiding people's troubles, but waited right in and helped out. I took on the troubles of the troubled, is the way Scripture puts it. You see, that's the model that Jesus left us uh, and showed us while he was on earth during this season of the incarnation. Paul said this in Galatians 6, 2, you know this, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What do we see in all of these verses? A life of service. Why? Because people matter. They matter to God and they matter to us. So Paul is telling us through this passage that we need to take the mind of Christ and really let it flow in and through us. Take all uh, you are and all you have and step down to where the needs really are. Somebody's thinking, well, all right, where do I begin? Great question. Uh, we can begin here. Uh, we're not only to be uh, focused upon our needs. There's nothing wrong with, with, you know, having needs, obviously, and attending to those needs. But the idea is this. There are so many people, so many desperate people around us. And so we need to, we need to look beyond ourselves. We need to take notice of other people, what they're going through, how they live, the struggles, the concerns, and, uh, and be focused there. Every believer should be concerned with reaching the lost, the lonely, the helpless, the hungry, and the broken within our community and city, within our country and world. How do we do that? Well, very practical things we can do. Everyone can do this. You ready? Every one of us can do this. Um, some very practical things. Number one, visiting people. We can visit, right? We do visit right? We need to visit, ministering to people, helping, listening, advising, feeding, clothing, counseling, and discipling and teaching them about the things of God. Every one of us can do this. So Paul's reminding us, this is what humility looks like. This is what a life of service looks like. He said in Philippians 2 and verse 4, now take a look. Don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and in what they are doing. Your attitude should be the kind that was shown us by Jesus Christ. So what was the attitude of Jesus? Uh, he did not please himself. He didn't come to please himself. He didn't come to be served. Remember he said that? But to serve. In humility, he counted the interest of others more significant than his own. And that's why Paul begins by saying, have this same mindset of humility. So for many of us, it, it's, it, it takes the renewing of the mind and the willingness for, for God to enlarge our heart. Lord, give us a greater capacity for the weight of ministry. Give us a greater capacity, Lord, and enlarge my heart to handle more people, to, to comfort more people, to minister to more people. That's the idea. It's the mindset that Paul is talking about. And why is this so important to do? Well, number one, it's Christ-like. Uh, it demonstrates love. It lightens the burdens of others. It informs a life of service. Personal humility. That's the real story of Christmas. And Paul is asking, does that story inform our story as believers? Finally, the incarnation is an example of personal 
obedience. Take a look at verse 8, Philippians chapter 2, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's outstanding enough that Jesus would take on human form, um, but he continued to humble himself in sacrificial obedience to the point of death on the cross. Now, crucifixion was not only the ultimate disgrace to a person's dignity, but no other form of death could match crucifixion as an absolute destruction of a person. This was the ultimate expression of Christ's obedience to his Father. Jesus himself said this in John chapter 10, in verse 17, he starts there and he said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Notice what Jesus said. No one can take my life from me. No one. I lay it down of my own accord. This is my choosing. And so the crucifixion was not a murder. The crucifixion was not an execution. It was not an incident. It was not an accident. The crucifixion was a sacrifice, a willing, personal sacrifice. The message is this. In the way that Jesus put aside personal status in sacrificial obedience to the call of the Father, so we must also put aside our personal agenda in sacrificial obedience to the call of God upon our lives. Why? Because people matter. This does not mean that we are to ignore our personal needs. No, but it does mean this, that we are to make sure that we make room in our lives for the needs of others. Lord, enlarge our hearts. That will require us to sacrifice at times, and our sacrifice then becomes part of the gift we give to others. That's what a life of service looks like. In the book, Celebrating a Christ-Centered Christmas, um, the author tells this story. An African boy listened carefully as his teacher explained why Christians give uh, presents to each other on Christmas Day. The gift is an expression of our joy over the birth of Jesus and our friendship for each other, she said. When When Christmas Day comes, the boy brought the teacher a seashell of lustrous beauty. Where did you ever find such a beautiful shell, the teacher asked. The youth told her, that uh, there was one spot where such extraordinary shells could be found. And when he named the place, a certain bay several miles away, the teacher was left speechless. Why, it's gorgeous, wonderful, but you shouldn't have gone all that way to, to get the gift for me. His eyes brightening as the boy answered, long walk, part of gift. You know, God came from heaven to a manger from a manger to a cross, from a cross to a grave, from a grave back to heaven, and we would ask God, why all the trouble? And he would simply say, long walk, part of gift. You see, this Christmas season, as we enjoy all the symbols, the songs, and the celebrations, let's remember the Christmas story we love so much is only possible because Jesus modeled for us a life of service through these three virtues. Number one, personal sacrifice. God is calling each and every one of us to live a sacrificial life. 
I remember Paul said it this way, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1. And he says, that's your reasonable service. Uh, that's the very least we, sh we should do for others. So Jesus modeled for us personal sacrifice. And then number two, he modeled for us personal humility, where you and I make a decision to take a step down, uh, to take notice of other people, to learn how to live beyond ourselves. You may be wondering, well, I don't know if I have the time and nor the capacity to really minister to others. Listen, pray this way. If your heart is here, and remember, Paul said, let this mind be in you. <laughs> in other words, think along these lines. You have the mind of Christ. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart. And so we need to make that decision. Go to God and say, Lord, increase my capacity to handle a greater weight of ministry uh, as I step into humility and notice the needs of others. God will do that. Trust me. Personal sacrifice, personal humility, and then, and then Jesus modeled for us personal obedience. You can't do all of this. You can't sacrifice. You can't be humble unless you're willing to obey. Personal obedience. And, um, you know, many times it's the laying down of our life. Like Jesus laid down his life and went to the cross. Well, Jesus said, you know, if you, uh, if you want to follow me, what did he say? Come on, you know, take up your cross and follow me. So there's a dying to ourselves for the sake of others, for the sake of the message of the gospel in uh, speaking life and showing love to other people who are maybe less fortunate uh, than we are right now. And so personal sacrifice, personal humility, personal obedience. And what did Paul say? Let this mind or let this mindset be in you. So we're in the Christmas season and I want to give us an opportunity. I'm concluding this message on the fact that we ought to live a life of service, right? And, and people matter. Well, they matter in every season of the year, and they matter today. They matter to God, they matter to us. And I want to give us an opportunity to allow this mindset of a life of service toward others to inform our actions and our behavior throughout this Christmas season and beyond this season into this coming year. Would you do that with me? Would you pray with me and, uh, and believe God? Why do we do this? Well, I've said it a number of times and, and here we go again, because people matter. They matter to God and they matter to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for stepping into the human condition, Lord, through your son, Jesus and offering this sacrifice of Christ on the cross so that whoever puts their faith and trust in Him could receive salvation and redemption and live eternally with Him. We thank You for that. We thank You, Lord, that You've given us life. We thank You, Father, that You've called us ministers of reconciliation with a message of reconciliation that we are your ambassadors. We don't take that lightly. And so we speak on your behalf. We live on your behalf. Lord, and we thank you for that, for empowering us. Lord, with the love of God that's shed abroad in our hearts, with the, with the Holy Spirit that we've been baptized with, we have, we have everything we need because of you, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. And so, Lord, we ask that you would enlarge our hearts, that we may handle a greater weight of ministry and take notice of other people. We're asking you to do this work in us. Change our heart, mold our heart, that we may bring life, strength, hope, and love to other people. 
We thank you for that, Lord. We know people matter to you, and we declare, well, they matter to us as well. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your strength. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Enjoy the season. Enjoy the time. Be a blessing to people and take notice. Why? Because people matter. God bless you. Hey, thank you so much for joining with me today. I would love to hear how this message impacted your life. Tell me what spoke to you and especially how we could pray for you. If you'd like to support us financially, just follow the prompts on the screen and that will enable us to continue with our mission here at Faith Community Church, which is transforming individuals and families through the gospel into empowered followers of Christ. I pray your life was empowered today by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Also, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. This way you can stay up to date with our latest content. Once again, thanks for joining with me. And remember, together we are living truth, changing lives, and loving God. God bless you.